Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. Hey, just want to say welcome to you, whether you're here in Center Court East on our Klein campus in Center Court West uh, or at the Woodlands. A very special welcome to the Woodlands campus celebrating their one year anniversary today. Can y'all join me in, yeah, celebrating what God's doing in our church. That's amazing. Uh, Week after week at Colson Tuff Elementary, what God is doing uh, in the lives of people in the Woodlands. So we're excited about that. Hey, also want to tell you about next week. We are starting a new sermon series. It's called Overcome. Uh, We've just recognized that in this season where where things are difficult, uh, where the economy is unpredictable, that we just want to walk with you through this journey of of reminding you that the cross of Jesus Christ helps us overcome. And so we're going to highlight how can we overcome our fears and our worry and the stresses that are happening in our lives. So please join us next week for that. Uh, Today is a special day. We have a guest speaker named Timothy Atik. He is the director of Vertical Ministries in Waco, Texas, on the campus of Baylor University. We call him TA. He's got a powerful word from the book of Genesis for us. Why don't y'all join me in welcoming him as our teacher this morning? Well, uh, good morning, Faith Bridge. How we doing today? It is uh, always a uh, joy and privilege to get to be here with you again. Uh, my name is Timothy Atik, and I serve as the director of Vertical Ministries in Waco. Vertical is a ministry on Baylor's campus that exists to ignite a passion in college students for Jesus Christ, His Church and his mission around the world. And I will just say, uh, just the love and the care and the the support that we have felt from FaithBridge has really been amazing. So thank you for uh, believing in the work that we're doing in Waco. Um, I wanna start this morning by just sharing with you a realization that I had that I believe applies to every single person in this room. So you listen to it and you just determine whether I'm right or not, okay? Here it is. Uh, You are either dealing with a difficult person in your life or you are a difficult person and someone is having to deal with you, all right? There it is, okay? And if you're sitting there thinking, you're thinking about if there's any difficult people in in your life, if you can't think of a difficult person, it might be because you are the difficult person in your life, all right? So here's the deal. If you are a difficult person, then someone needs to love you enough to just tell you that, okay? I'm offering to be that person this morning, and then I'm going to get in my car and drive quickly back to Waco. (laughs) And then for the rest of you, if you're dealing with a difficult person in your life, then the great news is this passage in Genesis is going to encourage you to deal with that difficult person in a way that is faithful, uh, healthy, and God-honoring. So if you have a Bible, I want you to turn with me this morning to Genesis chapter 30. Genesis chapter 30. Let me read you verses 25 and 26 because it's just going to kind of tell us at what point in the book of Genesis we're, we're kind of entering in right now. Okay, it says this. It says, as soon as Rachel had born Joseph, Jacob said to Laban, send me away that I may go to my own home and country. Give me my wives and my children for whom I have served you that I may go, for you know the service that I have given you. So we're looking at a story right now about uh, Jacob, okay? Several years before, Jacob basically weaseled his brother Esau out of his birthright, and it caused so much family tension that Jacob had to hit the road running for his life from his brother Esau. And so Jacob goes to live with a relative. His name is Laban. And Jacob strikes up a really bad deal with Laban where he agrees to work for seven years for his daughter Rachel. And uh, after that seven years, um, instead of getting Rachel, he gets Leah. And so he then makes another deal with Laban to work seven more years to get Rachel. So Uh, Jacob works 14 years total uh, to get Laban's two daughters as his wives. After those 14 years, he tacks on about six more years 
of service to Laban, so about 20 years of service in all. Uh, at some point, kind of during the latter half of that 20 years, he, he kind of Jerry Springers his way into a household full of kids. And if you don't know who Jerry Springer is, you're better off for it. Um, but he's got a household full of kids. And uh, at this point, Jacob reaches a realization that honestly, every guy should have at some point. He comes to the realization, hey, it's probably good for me to stop living with my father-in-law. It's probably time after 20 years for me to move out and get my own place. And so he goes to his father-in-law um, to get his permission to leave, and it is not a smooth exit. Watch how things play out. Starting in verse 27, it says this. It says, but Laban said to him, if I have found favor in your sight, I've learned by divination that the Lord has blessed me because of you. Name your wages and I will give it. Jacob said to him, you yourself know how I have served you and how your livestock has fared with me, for you had little before I came, and it has increased abundantly, and the Lord has blessed you wherever I turned. But now, when shall I provide for my own household also? He said, what shall I give you? Jacob said, you shall not give me anything. If you will do this for me, I will again pass to your flock and keep it. Let me pass through all your flock today, removing from it every speckled and spotted sheep and every black lamb and the spotted and speckled among the goats, and they shall be my wages. So my honesty will answer for me later when you come to look into my wages with you. Everyone that is not speckled and spotted among the goats and black among the lambs, if found with me, shall be counted stolen. Label said, good, let it be as you have said. But that day Laban removed the male goats that were striped and spotted, and all the female goats that were speckled and spotted, every one that had white on it and every lamb that was black, and put them in the charge of his sons. And he set a distance of three days' journey between himself and Jacob. And Jacob pastured the rest of Laban's flock. So uh, some people here are dealing with a difficult spouse. Don't say amen right now. Okay, thank you. Good self-control. Some people are dealing with a difficult spouse. Others, um, a difficult boss, difficult coworker. Some dealing with difficult kids different, difficult siblings, difficult friends. Jacob is dealing with a difficult father-in-law. So here's how things are going to kind of work. We're going to first spend some time looking at Laban, and Laban is going to show us what it looks like to be a difficult person. And then we're going to move on to Jacob, and Jacob is going to encourage us how to deal well with a difficult person in our lives. So if uh, you want to know if you're a difficult person or if you want the person sitting right next to you to know if they're a difficult person, here we go. Okay? The, the story begins with Laban being the only father-in-law in the history of the world who wasn't anxious, anxiously, or just anxiously awaiting the day to get his son-in-law out from under his roof. Okay? He's the only one who, after 20 years of living with his son-in-law, doesn't want him to leave. Okay? And what you need to realize is that um, this isn't about um, Laban being like a helicopter parent where he, uh, he doesn't want to see his two baby girls go and he wants to make sure that he can kind of keep tabs on them. It's not about that. It's not about Laban loving the time he's had with his grandkids in his home, wrestling with them and playing with them. So he hates to see them go. He hates to lose that kind of access to them. It's not what this is about. This is actually about Laban's bottom bottom line. Because what Laban has realized is when Jacob first showed up, he had a small amount of stuff. And because of Jacob's presence in his home, uh, Jacob has brought the favor of God upon Laban's household. And now what was once a small amount of stuff has become a large amount of stuff. And over the years, Laban has grown to love his stuff. And so he wants to do everything in his power to keep Jacob, because when he looks at Jacob, he doesn't see family, he sees fortune. And he has every intention of continuing to use Jacob to get more of what he wants. And it shows us something very important. Here it is. Difficult people use people. Difficult people use people. So if you're an employer here, and you love wealth and success more than you love your people, you will use your people to get more wealth 
in success. Just pay attention as an employer, pay attention to your turn turnover rate. This might not be the issue, but if you have a high turnover rate, it might be because your people feel used without, without feeling valued. If you view your spouse as existing for the sole purpose of meeting your needs, you might be a difficult person. There's something really biblical about um, bearing one another's burdens, but there's something very unbiblical about a one-way friendship. So if, you have a, if, if you're a friend right now who is allowing your drama to kind of monopolize your friendship, and the friendship is really about, all about you, and there's, there's never a point where the, where the relationship kind of turns around towards the other person, where you express care about how they are doing, it's possible that that is a difficult friendship because you're being a difficult person. Difficult people use people. And so the story, uh, the story goes on and, and Jacob comes to Laban asking for permission. I just want you to see Laban's response. Look at it again in verse 28. Here's how Laban responds. He says, name your wages and I will give it. Jacob said to him, you yourself know how I've served you and how your livestock has fared with me for you had little before I came and it has increased abundantly and the Lord has blessed you wherever I turned. But now when shall I provide for my own household also? And Laban says, what shall I give you? I assure you that when Jacob hears Laban say, uh, name your wage and what shall I give you? He probably had a wicked case of deja vu. This wasn't the only time that Laban had said these words to Jacob. He also said these words to Jacob when he first move in, moved in and struck up a deal for one of his daughters. He said, what shall I give you? Name your wage. And how did things play out in that story? Well, Jacob makes a deal to work for seven years to get Rachel. And the text is really clear that those seven years fly by. I mean, this is a guy in love. I mean, seven years flies by like nothing. He works the seven years, and at the end of the seven years, on his wedding night, in the middle of the night, Laban, his father-in-law, sneaks into his bedroom and pulls a switcheroo and changes out Rachel for Leah. Now, who does that, all right? Like, if you're really protective of your daughter, men, don't give a guy a blessing to marry her, all right? But if you give the blessing, there's no switcherooing on the wedding night, all right? Just, that's the rule. And so Jacob has to work seven more years. So now when Jacob hears Laban again say, name your wage, what shall I give you? He's guarded, why? Because he knows that Laban cannot be trusted to do what he says he's gonna do. He, he cannot be trusted to do what he says that he will do. And it shows us something very important. Difficult people are untrustworthy people. You cannot count on them to do what they say they're going to do. If you're a spouse, if you have, if you have communicated to your significant other that you're gonna cut back on spending, you're gonna cut back on drinking, you're gonna cut back on overworking, you're gonna cut back on looking at inappropriate images on the internet, but you don't, you need to know you are, you are putting an unnecessary strain on your marriage simply because you, you refuse to follow through. You refuse to be a man or woman of your word. You are being a difficult person. I just wanna have a really honest conversation with some of the middle or high school students in the room right now. Let me just say this. Um, if you tell your parents that they can trust you, but then you continually show them that you can't, that they can't. Like if you tell them that you're gonna be someplace, or you tell them you're gonna be home by a certain time, or you tell them that you're not gonna party, but you're not in that place you say you're gonna be, and you're not home at that time you say you're gonna be home, and you party when you say that you're not going to party, you need to know that if you and your parents are fighting a lot, and what you think the answer is, is for them to just give you your independence, you need to know that's not the answer. The answer 
is for you to learn, even at a young age, what it looks like to be a man or woman of your word. Difficult people are untrustworthy people. So Jacob comes to Laban and he, he strikes up this agreement and um, I just want to clarify what the agreement is because we just read a lot about these speckled and spotted sheep and goats and I would imagine everyone was following that perfectly, all right? But just for the few people who don't normally make deals with sheep and goats, let me just kind of tell you what's going on here. Um, Jacob is making an agreement that will allow him to cultivate his own flock. And the reason he wants to cultivate his own flock is so that he can have some standing in society. And because he's been working for Laban for a number of years, he deserves a portion of Laban's flock. And so the deal is this, uh, Jacob just says, how about from this day forward, any speckled and spotted sheep and goats that come out of your flock, they will become mine. Now the thought is this, speckled and spotted sheep and goats tend to produce speckled and spotted sheep and goats. Same colored sheep and goats tend to produce same colored sheep and goats. So the thought is, he would begin from that day forward to cultivate his flock from any new offspring from the speckled and spotted sheep and goats. Well, what does Laban do? He goes in and removes all of the speckled and spotted sheep and goats from his flock. Why? Because he is trying to control the situation. Because if, uh, if Jacob can't cultivate a flock, then he probably can't have any standing in society. And if he doesn't have any standing in society, he probably won't leave. And if he doesn't leave, then he will continue to bring God's favor onto Laban's household and pad Laban's bank account. This shows us something very important. Difficult people are controlling people. Difficult people are controlling people. So when it comes to your marriage or your, your work situation, if you will be as manipulative or as aggressive as you need to be with your spouse or with your employees because you want to get your way, if you will do that, I promise you, you are being a difficult person. And I want to talk about something very specific right here, but this is very important. When it comes to conflict resolution, like if, if you find yourself at odds with your spouse or with a friend or with a coworker, if, if your way of dealing with that conflict is to shut them out, cut them off, tune them out, give them the silent treatment, if that is your way of dealing with conflict, you need to know. You are being a very controlling person in that moment. Because your refusal to engage with them or enter into reconciling conversations, that is you trying to control how the relationship proceeds, when the relationship proceeds, and if the relationship moves forward at all. And it's just not right. And it's not fair. And now I want to talk about something that's even, it is even more sensitive. And uh, I say this with love. But I've learned, I have learned as a parent that there can be this desire as a parent to control every single aspect of my children's, my children's lives. And so I just, I just want to say this. There, I would imagine that there are people in this room, parents in this room who, who feel the need to control what clothes your kids wear, what their hair looks like, how they perform on the court even though they're only four and don't even understand the game yet. <laughs> you need to control what extracurricular activities they're involved in, you need to control what classes they take, where they go to college, what they major in, when they graduate, what job they take after they graduate, where they live after they graduate, who they marry, when they get married, what their wedding is like, how long they wait till they have children, what they feed their children, how they dress their children, how they discipline their children. Some of you are like, yeah, so, check, 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 check. <laughs> no, no. We just need to be very clear right here. There is a huge difference between control, controlling your children and loving your children. 
And we have to be very, very careful not to label control as love. Paul tells us in Ephesians, do not exasperate your children. How do you exasperate your children? By seeking to control your children. Difficult people are controlling people. Okay, so let me just, let me, let's just answer the question, where am I going with this, all right? The good news is I didn't just spend 20 minutes beating you up so that you could leave here wounded. Okay, the good news is that if you're kind of beginning to realize that you might be a difficult person, let me just pause right here and say, we are all difficult in one way or another. And if you're sitting there saying, not me, there's your problem, all right? We just pinpointed what makes you difficult, all right? We're all difficult in one way or another, so here is the great news. If you're realizing that you are difficult in some ways, here's the great news. You can't change who you've been, but Jesus Christ can change who you will be from this day forward. And Jesus Christ is in the business of giving fresh starts. So he can take you from being a person who uses people and he can shape you into a person who loves and serves people. If you're an untrustworthy person, he can mold and shape you into a reliable person. If you're a controlling person, he can mold and shape you into a trusting person. Jesus Christ is in the business of giving fresh starts. It doesn't matter how old you are or how uh, difficult you have been, Jesus Christ can do something great with your life if you allow him to. But I'll tell you where it begins. It begins with you coming to a realization that your way of doing things might be wrong and his way of doing things will most certainly always be right. So if you want to kind of turn the corner on being difficult, if you want to experience some, some traction in your life when it comes to just being a more pleasant person to be around, uh, let me just give you a few action steps this week. Number one, before your feet ever hit the ground every day this week, here's what I want to encourage you to do. I want to encourage you to just, just affirm what you know to be true and just say, Jesus, my way of doing things today will be wrong. Your way of doing things is right. I want to do things your way. Number two, Jesus, during the times when I'm being difficult, help me to know it. Help me to be aware of the times when I'm, being, when I'm using someone or being untrustworthy or controlling. Help me to know it. Because you can't make progress until you realize where you're going wrong. And then number three, God, fill me with your Holy Spirit that I might bear the fruit of the Spirit. What's the fruit of the Spirit? Well, love, joy, peace, patience, Kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness. And what's that last one? Self-control. Could anyone use a shot of self-control? I think we all could in one way or another. This is where it begins. I promise you, you begin to take those steps and you are going to see change for the better. So we just looked at uh, Laban. Laban shows us that difficult people use people, difficult people are untrustworthy people, difficult people are controlling people. Now we shift our focus to Jacob. And what Jacob is going to do is he is going to, to show us how to deal with the difficult people in our lives. So let me just remind you, uh, Jacob comes to Laban asking to leave, and I want you to see what Laban uh, Laban wants him to stay, and watch how Jacob responds in verse 29. Jacob said to him, you yourself know how I have served you and how your livestock has fared with me, for you had little before I came, and it has increased abundantly, and the Lord has blessed you wherever I turn, but now when shall I provide for my own household also? I really like this, because what we see here is Jacob he is expressing a clear conscience. He is confident in his conduct over the last 20 years. And what, what Jacob is telling Laban is, your life has been blessed by my presence in it. Your life has been better off because I have 
been here. And I really like that because that must be our aim when we're dealing with the difficult people in our lives. This is the goal. The goal is that their lives will be better off because we are in it. Why is that our goal? Well, because this is the model that Jesus has set forth. This is the example that Jesus has put forward. We have to realize that our lives aren't just better off because Jesus is in them. No, our lives are forever new because of Jesus' presence with us. We all have to realize that when it comes to God, we haven't just been difficult before God, we have been spiritually dead before God. Every single one of us enters this world physically alive, but spiritually dead. And as imperfect people before a perfect God, we're not deserving of that perfect God's love, we are deserving of his punishment. You realize that, right? We don't naturally deserve God's love. We actually deserve his punishment. But in his supreme love for us, he sent his son, Jesus, who was punished in our place. That's what Christ was doing on the cross. Jesus came. He lived the life that we couldn't. He died the death that we deserved to die, making payment for our sins. On the third day, he was raised from the dead so that his resurrection could become our resurrection, so that we could be raised as well to walk in newness of life. And when you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior for the forgiveness of your sins, you who were an enemy of God become a child of God. You who were deserving of God's punishment are now a recipient of his love. You who were separated from God have been brought near. In his love, acceptance, and approval is poured out upon you, not because of what you do for him, but because of what Christ has done for you. This is the good news of Christianity. This is why our lives are supremely better because of Jesus' presence in them. We aren't just better off. We are forever new. This is the model that Christ has given us. And when you experience this love, it is only right to express this love. So just take inventory right now of your relationships. This is, this is a great question to ask yourself. Is your marriage better off because you're in it? Is your family better off because you are in it? Is your workplace better off because this is where you work? Is your neighborhood a better neighborhood because this is where you reside? If the answer to any of those questions is no, the, the answer isn't to just get out and be like, well, my marriage isn't good. It's probably me. I'll bail. No, that's not the answer. The answer is Jesus. <laughs> And you can't change who you've been, but that's okay. Jesus Christ can change who you will be from this day forward. This is our aim. That our lives will bless someone else's life. That their lives, even though they're difficult, they would be better off because we are in them. So Jacob comes to Laban and he makes this proposition. I just want to remind you one more time what the proposition is. Look at verse 32. Jacob says, let me pass through all your flock today, removing from it every speckled and spotted sheep and every black lamb and the spotted and speckled among the goats, and they shall be my wages. So my honesty will answer for me later when you come to look into my wages with you, everyone that is not speckled and spotted among the goats and black among the lambs, if found with me, shall be counted stolen. So here we, here's what you need to know. In the ancient Near East, what Jacob would be entitled to for his work, he would be entitled to about 20% of Laban's flock. But Jacob knows that Laban can't be trusted to give him his 20%, so he, he makes this proposition that he will cultivate his own flock from the speckled and spotted goats and sheep, which we've already talked about. The problem is that the speckled and spotted sheep and goats of Laban's flock would be the minority. There is no way that Jacob would be able to cultivate the 20% that is rightfully his. So he's putting himself in a very tough position, but he does it knowing that God can Provide, And I think it shows us something very important here. And here it is. Jacob's hope isn't in Laban changing. His hope is in God providing. 
Jacob's hope is not in Laban changing. His hope is in God providing. I want you to think about this. If we were to enter into this really unhealthy time of the service, where I said, hey, if you're dealing with a difficult person in your life and that person is actually in this room, will you just raise your hand real quick? Don't raise your hand right now. Okay, this is a hypothetical scenario. If you were to raise your hand and I were to take a microphone, we were, begin to, we were to begin to pass it around the room and I were to say, hey, just share with us who the difficult person is and why, what, what the deal is and what you believe the solution to be. What do you think we would hear over and over and over? Well, we'd hear, well, this is my husband. We've been married 25 years. He's a bonehead. He uh, drives me bonkers anyway. Um, here's the solution. You know what? If he would just change... If he would just stop doing this. You know what? If she was just a little bit less of this and a little bit more of this, things would be if she, if he. I think that that's what we would hear over and over and over. If he, if she. What if the solution to your situation isn't found in the words if he or if she? What if the solution to your situation is found in the two words God will? God will provide me with everything I need today to be faithful in my marriage, in my workplace, and in my friendships, no matter whether or not that person ever changes. God will. You wanna deal with a difficult person in your life? Well, number one, you make it your aim to make their life better off because you're in it. And number two, you put your trust in God providing, not in the other person changing. And then number three, watch this. We get to this, uh, we get to this really interesting part, this passage in the Bible. And I'll just be honest, when I, when I read this passage, part of me just thinks, yeah, I don't know, God. Like, I, I don't know why you put that in there. Uh, Yeah, I just don't know. Watch. Here's why I think that. Just listen. Follow along. 37. Then Jacob took fresh sticks of poplar and almond and plane trees and peeled white streaks in them, exposing the white of the sticks. He set the sticks that he had peeled in front of the flocks in the troughs, that is, the watering places where the flocks came to drink. And since they bred when they came to drink, the flocks bred in front of the sticks, and so the flocks brought forth stripes speckled and spotted. And Jacob separated the lambs and set the faces of the flocks toward the striped and all the black in the flock of Laban. He put his own droves apart and did not put them with Laban's flock. Whenever the stronger of the flock were breeding, Jacob would lay the sticks in the troughs before the eyes of the flock that they might breed among the sticks. But for the feebler of the flock, he would not lay them there. So the feebler would be Laban's and the stronger Jacob's. Thus the man increased greatly and had large flocks, female servants, and male servants and camels and donkeys. Let's pray together and get out of here this morning. I mean, what is this about? This is crazy. I, I, okay, I don't want to spend much time unpacking this text. I will tell you this. Uh, commentators offer three suggestions on what's going on here. And just to be clear, these commentators have no clue what they're talking about because no one really knows, okay? Only God knows what's really going on in this passage. I'll tell you the three options and you can go home and beat your head against the wall. I've already done that, so it's your turn. Okay, here's the first option. First option is that there's some superstition surrounding these uh, sticks. Somehow these are magical sticks. And when it comes to breeding, They get the job done, all right? That's the first option. Here's the second option. In Jacob's vast knowledge of sheep and goats, he knows something that we don't, all right? Here's the third option. The third option is that at some point, Jacob had a conversation with God. And that conversation, if it ever happened, is not recorded in the scriptures. So you need to know this third option is a shaky option. It's actually the option that I lean towards, but it's a shaky option because it's not recorded in the scriptures. So it could be totally false. But the third option proposed is that Jacob had a conversation with God. 
And in that conversation, God commanded Jacob to put the sticks in the troughs, not because there's some power in the sticks, but he was giving Jacob an opportunity to demonstrate his faith in him providing. That's the way I lean, but that's just me. And honestly, it doesn't really matter. Because what the, the point here and what we see happening is God doing something extremely powerful in Jacob's life. We see God doing something extremely powerful. And I think what this really shows us is that Jacob knows who he truly works for. He knows who he truly works for. So Jacob is able to live with and work for Laban because he knows that he truly lives with and works for God. And this is very important for us this morning because this gives you hope. It might not be the hope you're looking for, but it gives you hope. Because what this means is you can live with and work for a difficult person who is selfish and untrustworthy and controlling because you truly live with and work for one who is generous and trustworthy and loving and freeing and faithful. And when you realize this, it frees you up to go through life with difficult people, responding to God instead of reacting to them. This is where freedom is really found, is when you can turn the corner and begin to respond to God instead of just react to the difficult people in your life. But it has to come from a realization of who you truly live with and work for, and that is Jesus Christ. You know, I look back on uh, Jacob's 20 years with Laban, <clears throat> And uh, these 20 years were by no means perfect. I mean, I told you at the beginning that he Jerry Springered his way into a household full of kids. It was not perfect. But if I were to kind of put a label on this 20 years of Jacob's life, I think the way I would label it is um, imperfect but faithful. Imperfect but faithful. And when I think about my life, if my wife or my kids were to ever put a label on my life, I would love for that to be the label, imperfect but faithful. In fact, I can't think of a bigger compliment than for someone to be called faithful. You know, it's interesting. We spend our lives wanting to be known for wealth or success or being high capacity or just even happy. But when you look at the scriptures, the, the scriptures are very clear on what God celebrates. You think you're going to get to heaven and God's going to be like, well done, good and wealthy servant. Well done, good and, and high capacity servant. Well done, good and beautiful. Well done, good and happy servant. No, we know what God celebrates. He celebrates faithfulness. So if you're dealing with a difficult person in your life, man, you make it your aim to be faithful. And if you are a difficult person, and we've already established that that's really all of us here, what is stopping you today from asking God to make a change in your life, to transform you from being difficult into being faithful? Just a reminder, it all starts with you having a relationship with Jesus Christ. It all starts with you understanding that before God, you're not just difficult, you are dead. And change is only possible when you are raised to walk in newness of life with Jesus Christ. That comes through faith in who he is and what he has done. No matter who you are, whether, you, uh, whether you're dealing with a difficult person in your life or you are a difficult person, someone's having to deal with you, may we leave this place and go out into the week cultivating lives where at the end, when we stand before God one day, we will hear those sweet words, well done, good and faithful servant. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, this is a uh, convicting text. It is, Lord, I need to hear it. You know that I have my ways of being difficult. And so I'm praying for change in my own life. Your way is right. And I pray for my friends in this room, Lord. God, we all just come before you and we are dead without you. We're not just difficult, we are dead. We need you, Jesus, to raise us to walk in newness of life. And we thank you 
that even though we can't change who we've been, you can change who we will be from this day forward. And so, Lord, forgive us all, for all the ways that we have used people, all the ways that we've been untrustworthy, all the ways that we've sought to control other people. And I just pray that you would help us turn the corner today. I pray, God, that we would be people who bless others, Lord. I pray that we would be people who put our trust in you providing, not in other people changing, Lord. And I pray that we would leave here knowing who we truly live with and work for, and that is you, the Lord of Lords and King of Kings. We need you. We love you. Amen. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Hi and welcome to Postscript. I'm Luann Riley, Grow Group and Discipleship Director here at FaithBridge and I'm here with Timothy Atik from Vertical Ministry, Bible teacher who just brought us a message around difficult people. And you used a passage from Genesis, yep. yet where we looked at Jacob and his relationship with his father-in-law. Yep. And I have to tell you, your message on difficult people, it definitely hit a nerve and a strain um, with the congregation, with myself as well, because I think everyone can relate to um, having people, whether it's in your workplace or in your family or in your friend group or yep. just out in public that yeah. you run into someone who you would say is a challenge or is difficult to deal with. Um, and I love how you started by looking at ourselves. Yeah, I don't know. struggle with being difficult, but I know that so many <laughs> well, other people do. So that's why I wanted to just, yeah, Thank you're you. welcome. And yeah. I love how you started with looking at ourselves yeah. um, as well. So, um, you know, we'll kind of start there then. Let's talk about that. Um, you know, if you're looking at yourself, this person did and said, you know, I'm recognizing the ways that I can be difficult. Yeah. Um, how do we begin then to transition into becoming a more loving, faithful person? Yeah, if, you, if you're realizing that you're a difficult person, then, you know, one of the best things you can do is, uh, is invite people into your life who can just speak truth to you. You know, I think about like the, those distorted mirrors inside of the crazy houses at the mall carnival places it just reflects a distorted image of yourself and and a lot of times if you're if you're trying to discern how difficult you are on your own you're just going to see a distorted picture of yourself you're either going to think you're more difficult than you are which isn't normally the case usually you try and see the best in yourself which is good but you end up not really realizing just how difficult you be you can be so you need to invite people into your life which is a really humbling thing but especially if it's a spouse or someone like that, but to sit down and say, hey, I, I need you to just kind of help me see, here's how I think I'm difficult, but then tell me the specific ways that you notice me being difficult. And so the first step is to identify the, the, the key places where you have a tendency to go the wrong direction mm -hmm. in life. Because when you, can, when you can identify those key places, so if it's, if it's when you're tired or, you know, when, you know, if it's a certain situation with your kids or certain kind of sticking points for you and your spouse, if you can identify those things, then come up with a battle plan with other people around you who can hold you accountable so that you can put that battle plan into practice. But also, I know for me, if I have people who are going to ask me every week, how are you doing specifically with this? It changes things because it makes me more aware of, of, you know, what I'm doing. The other thing is, you know, knowing the word of God is really powerful. You know, when Jesus was battling temptation in the desert, how did he combat Satan? He com combated him with the word of God. So, if you find specific ways that you're being difficult, if you can attach certain scriptures to those things, memorize it, meditate on those throughout the day, I promise you in those instances when you're tempted to be difficult, the spirit will bring truth to mind and it can really diffuse the situation. Yeah, good word. Okay, all right, so let's turn our attention to um, just being in relationship with a difficult person, um, whether it be a boss where I mean, this is someone that you're seeing every day. 
yep. is difficult or a spouse or maybe a family member. Um, how can, you, you know, you say try not to, not to react to the difficult yeah. person, but how can you do that? What are some ways that we can? Yeah, I think that this is the big question for people is, yeah, it sounds good in theory to respond to God instead of react to the person, but what does that, that truly look like? I'll just give you a few really practical, real practical things. You know, growing up, I grew up with a dad who's a clinical psychologist, which means I got free therapy for life, which is a really good thing. But mm -hmm. I just remember growing up, he always used to say, you know what, listening doesn't mean agreeing. Like to let someone say something to you without responding, that doesn't mean that you're agreeing with them. And I think that so many times, the reason that rea we react is we need to stick up for ourselves, we need to be right, we need justice to prevail in the moment. And the sooner we can realize we live in an unjust world and there's gonna be times where people say things to us that, that sting. And, and it, there's times where, I mean, you can fight back, but in the end, it's not gonna go it's not going to go well for you. And so listening doesn't necessarily mean agreeing. If your spouse says something, you know what? The reason that conflicts between spouses go from five minutes to five hours to five days is because we feel like we have the right to be right. So we want to win. We want to win the battle. And when you want to win, you will lose. And so if you can just, if you can, bite your tongue and just say, you know what, listening doesn't mean agreeing. And then, especially if it's, if it's with a spouse to come back at a later time when you're not in the heat of the moment to say, you know what, what you said really hurt me. And if they won't listen, then again, that's, a, that's another issue of them being difficult. But I think that's the first thing. And then number two, when it comes to reacting, especially, I know this with, with my wife, if we're in an argument, I promise you, if I can just pause and ask myself this question, if I can invite God in in the moment and just say, God, how do you want me to respond in this moment? If I could just allow myself to ask that for a second, it changes everything, I promise you. And it takes our fights from, you know, five hours to five minutes. It really can just cause things to, you know, it, it can shrink things, shrink the severity down. The bottom line is you are going to have difficult people in your life. There are people who are going to say things that really do hurt. And, um, you know, the reason w that it can cause so much turmoil is that we feel like we need to defend ourselves and we need to be, we need to come out on top of the other person. But when you look at the example that Jesus displayed for us on the cross, he won by losing. Mm -hmm. He did. He won by dying, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, he stood before Pilate and he didn't say a word. I mean, that's incredible. When Pilate was asking him to give a defense, everyone's hurling accusations at him. And what did he do? It said he remained silent. And so I think that there is something to that, to be able to bite your tongue, listening doesn't mean agreeing, and responding to God, just saying, God, how do you want me to respond? Maybe it means sitting here silently in fear in this person thinking that they beat me, can I be okay with them believing that they won, knowing that in the end, they're losing, if that makes sense. It does, it does. And so we had quite a few questions come in that were full of very specific, very hard, very difficult situations and challenges that people are facing. Yep. Um, broken relationships, um, just, just a lot of pain and a lot and a lot of hard things that they're walking through. Um, probably too specific and too hard to get into every single one of them here. Yep. Um, but I but I did want to bring them up and just say what what counsel, what advice, what wisdom do you have for those type of situations? Yep. Yeah, I will say I think the hard thing is that when I address an issue like this, you know, I have forty minutes to to basically get everyone to identify with the fact that they can be difficult and the, speak to the fact that they're dealing with difficult people. And so the thing, the hard thing for me is that what I don't want people doing is taking everything that I say and applying it to all of their situations and just taking the, the small amount of time that I had to speak truth and believing that it 
that that they can kind of work it into every area of their thing. Well, here's what I mean. So if someone is in a very abusive, especially physically abusive situation, I hope that they don't sit in there and say, well, I just need to, I just need to be okay with that. And I just need to allow myself, I just, I have to put up with that. No, um, there, there, might need, there might need to be some physical space there for you to get out of a very hostile environment. Mm -hmm. On the flip side, I, the hard thing for me is that people, I think sometimes people want me to give them per permission to bail on a relationship just because they're tired of it. Mm -hmm. And so I think, I, I think it's good for me to say we, I, I can't begin to address your specific situation in this short video. What I would encourage you to do is if you feel like you are in a very difficult situation with a difficult person, you absolutely need an outside perspective that I can't give you just on camera right here. And so you need to invite some community into your life. I, I would first say you invite maybe a small group into it, people who love God, love His Word, and love you, to give you a perspective, outside perspective. And if they can't give you an unbiased perspective, um, then I would encourage you to seek out pastoral counseling from the church or even professional counseling. We all need counseling. That's why the Holy Spirit is called the counselor, because we all need counseling. And so do not be afraid. Do not just take this talk and try. Do not let this, let this talk just be the, the tipping point that, that causes you to take action and seek out more wise counsel. Okay, so that would be my encouragement is to say, yes, I would imagine some of you are in very difficult situations that I can't begin to speak to now, but someone does need to speak into it. Um, and so please seek out that, that help. Good. And I like the encouragement that you gave us about starting our day before our feet hit the floor. Yeah. And this person wrote in and said that they want to make index cards for their family to keep them in nightstands so they can pray it every morning. So could you go through those yeah. three things for us again to encourage us? And I love that they're making index cards, putting it on the nightstand, because I know for me, when I, when I hear something that I want to put into practice from a sermon. If I don't, if I don't have some tangible way of reminding myself to do it, I just don't do it. I might do it for the first day and then it's just off the radar because life is hectic. So I do encourage, I mean, the great thing is that we have so many different ways now with technology that we can remind ourselves to do things. So the three things are number one, before your feet hits the ground, when your eyes open in the morning, just affirm what you know to be true. Just say it to God, say, God, my way of doing things today will be wrong, your way of doing things will be right. So I, I wanna say yes, even from now, to your way of doing things, that's what I wanna do. Um, the, the second thing is to ask God to just show you the times where you are being difficult, that He would really illuminate them, that they would kinda of smack you in the face, that you would know, okay, this is a time where I'm being difficult, because when you finally realize it, that's when you're gonna to begin to desire change and then the third thing, great prayer to pray every morning is just, God, fill me with your spirit that I might bear the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. We all need those. So invite that into your life. And I promise you, you do those three things. It's not just going through the ritual of those things, but it's actually living those things out I promise you, you're going to see change. It might not be an overnight transformation, but slowly but surely, the goal is just take a step. If you see a little bit more fruit than yesterday, that is a win for sure. That's good. That's good. Well, it's, it's always a pleasure to have you with Thanks. us. Thank you again, and good to see you again. Yep. Thank you for your message, and thank you for joining us here for Postscript. We'll see you back here next week. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org postscript.